believe the topic we have been given is a very important topic. Witnessing as a lifestyle. There are three things that you need to understand in that topic. Just put that way. Three things that you can witness without your lifestyle. That means it becomes like a job you do. So you know there are many people who make bread and don't eat it. I know in the Broadways is here in Broadways is here in uh, in um, in Vika, isn't it? And they make very good bread. You can be some of us sitting here, maybe working there, making bread, but because they are sleeping, they don't take <laughs> bread. So it means it's possible to witness, but it's not backed by your lifestyle. Number two, that it is possible to witness using your lifestyle. In other words, the way you live your life can be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you don't know that it is possible, then you will not try it. Number three, that there are people who don't do either. They neither use a lifestyle to witness, nor do they witness with their words. They simply don't. And all the three categories are seated here. Are we together? <laughs> all the three categories are seated here. So it's important to be aware we are not discussing with the people out there. When I say seated here, even the ones seated outside. Are you hearing me? Those of you outside, are you hearing me? They are not answering. They may not be hearing me. Uh, okay, they are. So, so all of us are in it. And I want to spend a bit of time discussing. You know, I, I know sometimes people ask, where were you taught? But I'll tell you the interesting thing, and uh, Dr. Wakaba and I were in the Christian Union together. We used to be in the same committee in 1974. And um, <laughs> 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 we were in the same CEO committee in the executive. <laughs> and um, I don't know, but those of us who were in the university in those times in the 70s, we knew without any doubt that once you are born again, you are expected to witness. It's not by choice. If you don't want to witness, don't get saved. Are you getting the difference? <laughs> because the moment you get saved, you must witness. He and I belong to a group we started in the university. We used to call ourselves SOC, Sojourners of Christ. And we went many places using our own boom. We used to call it boom. Robert is God now. Now, no, now these days you take a loan. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Now, it's important to understand that's what we did. I can remember my, when I left university, I was employed by the Venom Bank. As soon as I arrived there, it was obvious for me that the reason God has put me in the bank is to ensure that the clients get the loans and repay them, but beyond that, that Christ would be known in the bank. It, 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 nobody tells you. I mean, <laughs> it was expected that the reason you are joining the bank is so that you can be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it took just a few months before I felt exactly how can I be a witness here. And I finally went to the personnel manager. Those days were not called HR is a new word. Those guys were called personnel. Now, and I said, can you give me a room where we can meet and pray for the bank? Of course, my intention is that way we have a witness, and anybody who wants to join us will have a witness. Am I communicating? So they say, praying for the bank. Surely, who can refuse? So we were given, <laughs> so we were given a place to pray. And sure enough, it worked. People came, of course, initially, it's Mama Chai who comes, you know, because my fellow office, bank officers, feel too embarrassed to be in a lunch hour fellowship. So, but by the grace of God, people got saved. One of the people who got saved is the son of Dead and Kemadi. And I forgot her about it because that's 77 or 78. I forgot her about it until the other day when my mother died, he came to, to our house and he was telling another person, I was, he was trying to show how he knows me. And you see, 
John led me to the Lord. That's 40 years ago. John led me to, I had forgotten I even led him to the Lord because he got to know the Lord, became a leader, became a preacher, and so I forgot about it. But it all started because as a person entering the bank, I was asking the Lord for how am I to be a witness through my work and during my work and as I work. And um, so he started the fellowship, and I can go on. After some time, I was pushed by Shell. No, I'm not a, a wildlife, but that's the time they use. <laughs> that's the time they use in industry. When somebody somebody rang me and said, "Could we talk?" And one led the thing to the other. And in 1979, I finally moved from the bank, and I started working for Shell. And this was a Muzungu place. My immediate problem is, how do you witness here? Because it's not the question, are you going to witness? Is how? Because there isn't an issue that you can be born again and be in a company and nobody knows Christ. Because you see, I have been taught in the university that the Ezekiel message is my message. And he says, once you are born again, you are a watchman. And if a watchman sees a foreign army is coming and does not say it, and so the town is attacked and people die. The Bible, the prophet was categorical. God will require the blood of those people on the watchman's hands. Have you read that? That's what you are told. So it's not something you are doing voluntarily. Are you getting me? <laughs> Don't, do not even congratulate me. It, it, is, it is not voluntary. I had read also about Paul. Paul says, woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. In other words, Paul is saying, don't congratulate me. I'm not preaching. It is it not, nothing even to do with enjoying. I have no alternative. Because I'll be in a curse if I don't preach the gospel. So I was struggling, wondering exactly. And by the way, all that is put in my book, The Christian Professional. I've tried to share, to, because I wrote the book after I retired from Shell, and have felt the freedom to just share a lot of those things. So if you pick my book, the Christian profession, you will see some of these things I'm sharing. And one of the things that I asked, exactly how do I do it? And that's when I realized they used to show us films in the Shell BP house um, on the top floor, seventh so floor, they had, a, they had a theater. And during the lunch hour, they would give us films about exploration, about oil. Pretty boring, not many people attended. So I went to the library guy and said, is it possible I assist you? How? I'll bring you films, action, you know, action films, you know, something that people enjoy, and you can show them. Of course, knowing I'm saved, he was suspicious about, <laughs> <laughs> about what I'm saying. But I pushed, I pushed until one day he agreed. I ran to the, I ran to the NCCK library, uh, Dr. Wakaba will know, they used to, we used to borrow films there for the, during the university at Nairobi Chapel. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I started, uh, I started, well, no, of course, not me. I just pay for them with my own money and then give the guy. Because, of course, the company has no interest in what I'm doing. Then, then I show, you know, and I chose the right one. One of them was a thief in the night, and it was properly advertised. Now, obviously, you can see it's the attraction. To see a thief in the night. <laughs> but those of, you, those of you who are older will know it was a very popular film, but it's a witnessing film, isn't it? Oh, as they came out, they said, they told him, this is what you should be showing us. This is the action we like. We like. <laughs> so now that opened the door. From then onwards, I was now able to bring films. My job was to go to, 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 the, to, to a church house, select, action, not preaching films, but action films that are preaching. I'm getting the difference. <laughs> and uh, share, with, and share, with the, share with the people. After a number of times, the boss, the departmental head of that department said, Nanga, I hear these films are becoming very popular. And you pay with your own money, yes. Your own salary is supporting a multinational. Said, what could I do? I'm giving instructions. From now onwards, come with the receipts. All the money will be returned to you. Wow. From then onwards, I started witnessing a share cost. You need to understand. <laughs> because now I was entertaining the share of staff. And so they wanted it, they felt it's unfair for me to be using my little salary to support them. Now, I, if I go like that, I don't have enough time. I'm trying to take that a minute. But, and, uh, 
and I am measuring, I have a timer, so I'm, I'm measuring my time, so I will not be able to spend it. So I encourage you to speak the book and share them. But the reason I'm used starting with a testimony is because anything I say will not be new to you. All I can do is share my testimony so that it encourages you. But you know, not too long ago, I retired. Cheryl said I was an old man. So <laughs> I, 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 stopped, I, stopped, I stopped working there. Of course, I checked the Bible. The Bible has no place for retirement. <laughs> it's not a scriptural word. You know? The only people that were allowed to change jobs were the priests. They could only work at the, at the, 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 the place where the, 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 the actual sacrifice is for between 30 and 50. But after 50, they did not stop working. They now did other duties in the temple. So the idea of retirement is totally unbiblical. So I know some of you are going to be unhappy because you are just a few years to retirement. But you need to understand it's not scriptural. You cannot retire. All you can do is be retired. Get new tires. And normally, when, <laughs> and normally when, transporters, when transporters buy new tires for a lorry, it's not to pack it. It's because there is a trip to go. Am I communicating? <laughs> so when you retire, it's so that you can now get new tires to go somewhere else. And that's what I did. I registered a consultancy firm. And a lot of things I do in my consultancy affect training. And I've done a lot of training in, with all companies. And I was wondering exactly in this kind of place where you are not in one place, you move here, then you move there, exactly how will the witness be? And I was a little confused and praying, exactly like the first time, but now new praying in the new atmosphere, wondering exactly how to deal with it. But I didn't go on, as I put the matter to the Lord, it didn't take long. Before I was doing a workshop, a training workshop, and when I finished, a young man followed me, said, can you be my mentor? That's a new jargon these days of young people. Can you be my mentor? I said, but you don't even know me. Oh, I know. I know. What do you want from me? He says, you know, you were able to work in your industry until you got to the top leadership of the biggest oil company. I want you to help me to go that way. I said, okay, I'll buy you a cup of tea. So I bought him a cup of tea. And I told him, so what impresses you is my professional career, yes. Maybe in the workshop I would not have said it, but now that we are the two of us, I can tell you. The reason I made it from a junior officer in Shell right up to top leadership was because I knew Jesus. If you truly want to be like me, it will be unfair to cheat you. The Lord helped me. <laughs> and so if you really want to go up your career ladder, and of course, I'm not joking, I'm serious. I know, I know myself, I know my background, I know I don't deserve anything. The Lord helped me. So if you are asking me to help you to go up, I can only tell you how I went up, isn't it? And so I shared with him. And now he said, I would like to receive that Lord. And we were in a restaurant, and he gave himself to the Lord. Amen. Since I retired, there are now more than 10 professionals who have come to know the Lord because of my consultancy. Amen. Not even long ago, even the last month, somebody else came to know the Lord. And it's always very different from the earlier time. It's always somebody wanting to be mentored. Am I communicating? And they come. And I mentor them into Jesus. <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's a, and the Lord has opened doors. So it's important to understand that it does. And of course, it's a true of whoever. I mean, but for me, I don't get credit. Because the Lord himself seems to find a way of making it op open. And it's, it can happen anywhere. It can happen anywhere when you are conscious. But let me start by saying that we need to be clear as a church, as individuals, but as a church. And we're asking, what is the mission of the church? Why does the church exist? And they met in Lausanne. Lausanne, uh, uh, Committee for World Evangelization, had a conference in Manila, 1989. And they met and decided, discussed what it means to be a church and what your work is. And it says, the work of the church is to mobilize the whole church. So our first job is mobilizing the church for evangelism. So that any church 
that does not innovate itself in ensuring that anybody who comes to the Lord is also equipped in how to witness. It's a failed church. No, no, a failing church, because it's not failed yet. But it is a failing church. Because there are people who are not witnessing because the person who led them to the Lord did not show them how to witness. You know the scriptures are clear. Matthew chapter 28. Go to the whole world. Why? So that you may win people to the Lord. Then teach them. Have you read that? So that it means that anybody who comes to the Lord must be taught how to be a witness and how to obey whatsoever Jesus has commanded. Are we together? So that it's important to understand that the church is failing in what the Russian Commission of Revelation called mobilizing the church, the whole church, for evangelism. And so you need to ask yourself, if you want to check whether your church has a successful church, or you need, and I will not do it now, I don't want to embarrass my friend, um, Kerega, but you need to understand, <laughs> you need to understand the way to find out whether you are a biblical church is to ask people seated in front of me, how many of you have talked to an unchristian this week about his spiritual condition. If you get 50%, you are doing very well. On average, you don't get more than 20%. And that is a, a knee. You know, 20% is E, or is it a F? You need to understand. <laughs> because you see, if to be a church means to mobilize people for evangelism, the way you know whether you are the church of Jesus Christ is how many people are, have caught up and are witnessing. And you know, somebody like a pastor like my brother here, Gideon, it's very difficult to know how to witness because he spent his time talking to Christians. Oh, this one is quarreling with the husband, but he is still a, he is still a Christian. The other one is sick, but he's still a Christian. But for those of us working in this university, we are a minority. Every direction you turn this way, an unchristian. Turn that, everywhere I is, an un, am I right? Do you have any challenge getting an unchristian? <laughs> so you need to understand clearly when you have people who do not witness as a way of life. It means you are not a biblical church. Are we together? So you need to understand. So as a church, our biggest job, and you need to understand, when you lead somebody to the Lord, like I've done, I normally disciple them. How do you know that somebody is ready and now you can leave them on their own? Would you like to know? If you are, if you are from the rural area, you understand me. If you are from town, forgive me. Now, but if you are from the rural area, if you a cow gets a calf, a she calf, uh, a calf, you continue allowing it to take milk, after some time you remove it from milk, it can eat the grass, isn't it? Then it continues being a calf. The day it needs AI, a town people will not understand, but the day it needs AI, what does that tell you? It's no longer a calf, it has become a cow. Am I communicating? That's the way you know. And in church, it's exactly the same. Anybody who is not ready to witness to be another child is a baby Christian. Am I communicating? You are still a calf. You are not yet. You are not yet. A cow. The way you know you are a cow is that you are so happy in, with Jesus in you, you want everybody to know about it. Yes. And you are telling others. So the church may be full of baby Christians. Am I communicating? <laughs> because that's the way you know. Once you cannot say somebody is discipled unless they have started witnessing. You know, one of the reasons people don't witness is because they are not sure about who they have trusted. So that's why you have to disciple them, isn't it? So when you see somebody who never witnesses, he himself is not sure. You know, for example, you yourself are not sure that you are a Christian. How will you tell somebody else to join something you are not sure about? But once you are sure, enjoying a relationship with Christ, you want everybody. And women know that. If you go to a shop, you buy a dress, everybody keeps saying, wonderful. Where? Do, why in London? <laughs> I'm sure every woman you call friend will know the shop. Am I right? 
So you need to understand that if you, are, if you buy a dress, nobody ever comments, including your husband. You never... <laughs> there is nobody else who will ever know about that shop. Am I right? <laughs> nobody else will ever know about that shop. So it's important to understand the reason why we don't witness is because we are not enjoying our relationship with Christ. So that's the first thing. So you need to understand as you lead somebody to the Lord, you must help him to understand what he has entered into, what are the benefits, and once he starts enjoying the benefit, it will be easy for him to start telling others about it. He will look at somebody, see how, what troubles he's going through, if only he knew the Lord. So you tell him, isn't it? And it's important to understand that. The second thing they said in Manila is that after you have mobilized the whole church, and that word whole is very critical, because in a lot of, in a lot of churches, they have people with the gifts in evangelism. People with the gifts in evangelism. And they're the ones who do. They even, there's a mission committee. So others are not involved in it. Because after all, they don't have the gift of evangelism. But this message, they say, no, evangelism is not for the gifted. Evangelism is for everybody born again. That's what they say, the whole church. You know, it's very interesting. Many pastors will tell you, we are going for a mission, but those of you with the gift come. So they have excused everybody else, except the ones with a gift. But when you are taking offerings, nobody said, those of you without the gift of giving, <laughs> <laughs> let the bag pass. Have you ever had a pastor? <laughs> but you know the truth? Let the truth be told according to the scriptures. There are people with the gift of giving. And I had a neighbor like that. I, I looked at her. She would, we were, she would come with a, when, when, when the Amin was still there. She would come. She has meet a Uganda, in, a Uganda in town and bring them home. Said, what happens to your children? Oh, how could I have left her? Now, for you, you can help on a long arm. <laughs> Maybe buy, book them in a hotel. For them, they bring them at home. And finally, the good thing with the, our friend, she has, she has retired, got new tires, gone to her farm and turned it into a guest house. Now she is doing what she used to do in a small place. And now she can accommodate every April, I normally speak in a seminar there, and she's about to accommodate about 50 couples. That's 100 people, isn't it? Mm. Now you need to understand that clearly there are people with the gift of giving, mm. but nobody is allowed not to give. Similarly, there are people with the gift of evangelism. The scriptures are clear. But everybody must evangelize. The difference is, without a gift of evangelism, when you go with you who has a gift, by the time the week is over, you have brought ten to the Lord. But me, with all effort, I only have brought three. But because both of us did it, the total will be thirteen. Am I communicating? <laughs> If you start understanding that, if you are 10 of you, and only two of you have the gift, they will bring 20. And the other eight times three, eight times three is 24. 24 plus 20? And what about if only the two people had gone? Are you getting my point? So it's important. I am not arguing against the scriptures. The scriptures are clear. There are people with the gift of evangelism. But all of us must. And that's why they said, you must mobilize the whole church. Then he went on to say, um, they, you must go to the whole world. These people, once they are mobilized, must be taught to go to the whole world. When he said the whole world, it means we come to church, but we live in different places. Some of you live on campus, others are in Georgia, and some are even coming from Roiru. Am I right? So when you live here, if you live here, you all of a sudden are going to go everywhere. Once the people have been mobilized, they will go to the whole world. You know, I, I, um, my church is Sitam Barry Road, and for a number of years I was working for Shell in the regional office, covering about 10 countries. And I discovered over time we are in, we are in Johannesburg, and I see somebody else from the church. Next time I'm in Ghana, I see somebody else from the church. I realized that when you preach on Saturday morning, people are passing through home to pick air, air and they are going to, to the airport and they are flying every direction. So when you mobilize them, they literally go to the whole world. 
The only trouble is, if they are not mobilized, they will still go. But the gospel will not. Am I communicating? So he said, you must teach people to go to the whole world. You know, there are people who believe witnessing is in style. In fact, when we were in, when we were in 1970s, I, I, we started a team in 1974 in Yandarwa that was going to, we were preaching everywhere. Then we tried to involve, we didn't have any car. So we started to involve somebody with a car. He told us, no, no, I don't get involved to disorganize evangelism. When you're organized, call me. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, if you cannot witness anywhere, chances are you will not witness anywhere. May I repeat? If you cannot witness everywhere, yeah, chances are you don't witness anywhere. Am I communicating? Because you see, that it's not something you do deliberately. You know, I still remember one of the things I do when I'm flying. I tell the, they ask you, which, do you want a window seat or not? I just say, whichever. I believe that whoever will sit next to me in the aircraft is a prisoner captive to my, <laughs> to my witnessing. Because you see, if you are sitting together, where can they go? It's the aircraft, they will follow. Now it's very important to understand they are just with you. So I said, God, give me someone. I still remember a time I, I was flying from, from Mombasa, and it's only 45 minutes, only to discover the person next to me is an Indian. And I told the Lord, I intended to wait in this, but then we can see. <laughs> <laughs> With the 45 minutes, surely it should be understood, where will I begin? A cow is not God. Well, by the time we reach there. So, and because I was tired also, I was, I was on duty from Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Mombasa, I was tired anyway. I sat back. My friend, as, I, as they, they started giving us refreshments, the, the, the Asian next to me, this Indian whom I'm not witnessing, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, took his thing in a hurry. Ha! And he realized, I'm looking at him, he said, hey, you know, I've had a very rough time at the port. Oh, I'm dry. So I said, can you, would you like mine? Because I had just taken lunch. Would you like mine? He said, you are serious? You can give me? That began the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and in talking, I discovered he is not from India. He's an Indian, but not from India. He already understands about the Bible. We were not to discuss the cow. Am I communicating? <laughs> I remember another time, I was flying, I was flying, from, I was flying again from Mombasa. And again, I prayed, God, give me someone. I turned out that it is again an Indian. I said, God, I mean, these people are not the type I can witness to. <laughs> and I, was, I, so I decided to give up and open my book. And I started reading, ignoring the guy. So I'm reading. Then he, he, he turned to me and said, hey, sir, are you in construction? I said, I wondered, how could he just look at me and think I'm a, I'm a contractor? <laughs> Where, where has it come from? <laughs> I was a little confused. But I realized he's looking at the book. I was reading a book on mission called by Bodwick called Building Blocks for Mission. <laughs> I just come from <laughs> I just come from a commission and during focus commission and I just bought a book, Building Blocks for Mission. So that he was sure. I'm also in. <laughs> so once, <coughs> once I noticed. I said, yes, I'm in construction. <laughs> now, and then I explained my construction deals with spirits. <laughs> but that opened up, and he told me, oh, I understand you. I went through a Catholic school. My parents put me through, he is a Kenyan Indian, and he went through a, Kenyan, a Catholic school. He understands the Bible, he is aware about it, and for the rest of the time we are talking. It was only me. Are you getting what I'm talking about? They were told not to just mobilize, but to disciple them to go everywhere. To the whole world. The whole world means nobody deserves not to be told. If you are in China, they need to know. In Russia, they need to know. And there are people, young men, who are going into frontline mission work. They don't go places where the church already exists. They specialize. And, and if you like, you, if, you, if you want, just read, buy some books with youth, youth, youth uh, with a mission or mobilization. And uh, you and you see how many young men are finishing their degrees and moving because they have been taught. Evangelism is not taught to talking to your neighbor. It's using your career to go places. And you know, these days, to view pool, if you fill in your visa application, you're a missionary. Nobody will ever welcome you. 
They are not interested in missionary. But when you are an engineer from a top university like Jomo Kenyatta University, and you apply to Saudi Arabia to do their construction, they will welcome you, isn't it? Once you are there, chochote, chaweza, kutokea. Am I communicating? You start understanding. And that's one of the things people don't know. You know, that's why we are discussing lifestyle evangelism. When you understand your job is a platform, is a vehicle for reaching people for Christ. And you know, I remember many years ago, I was talking in Nyeri to a focus branch meeting, and I talked like this. And then, you know, you're talking to young people, and you, you go back. Several years later, I was in the street of Nairobi when somebody stopped me. Say, hey, brother, I couldn't remember. He said, do you remember talking to us in Nyeri, focus? I said, I can remember the discussion, but not about whether you are there. He <laughs> says, I was there. And you told us to use our careers to go to wherever. You know, I saw a vacancy in Saudi Arabia, and I applied to be an English teacher, because I was already teaching in high school here in Kenya. And uh, do you believe, can you believe it, John? He actually opened the door, and have now been teaching Princess children, you know, the, the, in Saudi Arabia they are called princes. He teaches. And you know, how do you do it? Since you, all I needed was to come with Christian material. All the prince wants is for their children to talk English. So the Bible <laughs> is a very useful tool for teaching English. So they can now give stories about Jesus. And the father is very impressed that the son can speak English. But by the time they know English, they also know Jesus. Are you getting the point? <laughs> you need to understand the problem is people think mission work is becoming a pastor. They think mission work is becoming a missionary. Quote and quote. That style of penetrating the world is as good as God. The new style, and there's a book written on it, God's Envoys if you're interested in this area of mission. It is using your career to penetrate. And I'm talking to some of you who are students, isn't it? And I'm not talking academic things. The other day, I spent half a month in, in Rwanda, and one of my hosts was somebody from this church. I'm sure Dr. Wakaba will know. So he said, hey, John, you used to speak to us in Jomo Kenyatta. I said, what are you? I'm a missionary in Rwanda. He works with the students. He is the one who took me to the, to the universities there. And I said, so where, where's your home church? And he knows you, knows you, and I realized, of course I can't remember him, he knows me. He knew me, yes. And he is doing a wonderful job in Rwanda. So we are not talking, for this church we are not discussing academics. This is reality. If you don't go, please admit you are a rebel. It is there. <laughs> There is nothing, you have examples. I'm not communicating. You have examples of people who have left this church to go out to be witnesses. I'm not communicating. And it's important to ask yourself exactly how are you moving. Unfortunately, my watch says the time is up. But let me finish. So, the work of the church is mobilization and in discipleship of people to become witnesses. Number two, to send people to every group. When you say the whole world, it means every career, every neighborhood, every tribe. Are we together? Every nation. Number three, with the whole gospel. In other words, it's possible to mobilize the church, but it's a cult. So what message they will send is cultic. So it's important you understand is our mission is to mobilize the whole church to go to the whole world with the whole gospel. Are we together? And it's important that the people of God are shown. I was yesterday morning, I was in another university and we were talking about their recent mission. I think they had gone, I don't know which county. And they said one of the things that shocked them is they have gone with the people. Once they take the mic, the things they are saying, you want to close your ears. You feel, how did I join this good team? Because you see, everybody wants to go, and some of it, the mission is tourism. You are going to a county you have never been, and you have the pocket money anyway, so you're able to pay. So I was telling them, you cannot get people for a mission without 
a training program. And not an orientation. Do not mistake an orientation program as a training program. You know, we meet just a Saturday before the mission. That's called orientation. Not training. Training is a, with a syllabus, a process that gives answers four questions. Number one, who qualifies to witness? So they can know whether they qualify to go. Number two, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? What message are you going to take? What message? They must be taught. Number three, who is our target? Are we together? Number four, what are common mistakes done in mission? Preempt them. Are we together? And it's important to understand that. So, this idea of lifestyle evangelism, the basics that I'm summarizing is, first of all, you yourself need to enjoy the gospel. Anybody enduring the gospel is unlikely to be a witness. I know here we are saved, but some of us are enjoying Christ. Others are enduring him. To be a witness, it must be something you enjoy. You know, I look at my own life. And Dr. Wakaba knows my village. And I, I ask, if the Lord never saved me, who would be John Nganga? And I feel indebted to him. So even as I move from place to place, I don't feel debted. Like this weekend, I have a, I have a very tight program. This afternoon, I'm with another church. Yesterday, I was in the university. And then in the afternoon, I was in a men's, men's conference at Valley Road. And I just come from Nyeri yesterday morning because I was speaking at MTC Nyeri. But I don't feel tired. Why? I'm in debt. The Lord has done a lot for me. So the lifestyle evangelism will start when you start enjoying Christ. Understanding you are who you are because of him. Number two, we have said it will be important, very, very important, that you understand evangelism is done through your work. And how do you do that? Number one, you do a job itself that benefits mankind. You cannot be a prostitute passing AIDS in the name of evangelism. Am I communicating? They think there are jobs you do where you, you tell them you are saved. <laughs> you mean you are saved <laughs> and giving AIDS. Now, it's very important to understand. <laughs> very important to understand not every career is formation. Don't say, I'm going to be drug trafficking for Jesus. No. Am I communicating? So it will be important in laughter evangelism, do something that's benefiting mankind. Because in benefiting the mankind, they will be able to listen to you. Am I communicating? Number three, it will be important you do your job so well. If it's a business, your product, your service should be extraordinary. And people start asking you, how? How do you, how do, you do this? <laughs> then you can turn them aside and, by the way, like I do, <laughs> Jesus is in my life. Some people are the, ca they, they are the cashiers where money never balances. <laughs> then they are telling people to be saved. And they wonder to be losing money. It's very important to understand. <laughs> to understand the lifestyle evangelism will require what you do, you do well. For example, we have to talk about your neighborhood. If you are in the neighborhood and you have made your wife a drum, crying every night. You need to understand, you can tell your neighbor about the salvation and says, you mean you want me to also to make mine a drum? It's very important to understand there is no way you become a difference in your neighborhood if the way you live is not admirable. Am I communicating? The others may not be doing what you are doing, but they like what you are doing. So it's important to understand if you are going to have lifestyle evangelism, you cannot, during office hours, be witnessing. Let your job be so well done, people will be asking you, hey, I like to understand why you do it like that. You are insulted by the boss, yet you did well. How? How do you manage? And you are able now to have time. They are the ones asking. In fact, I remember a time when one of my bosses asked, Nganga, somebody as senior as you, this thing was done by old women, how did you get involved in it? So I asked my boss, it was during office hours, and I don't like during office hours. He said, you really want to know? He said, yeah, sit here. In fact, the secretary rang him and said, no, 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 I'm doing something serious. He was in conviction. He wants to hear who Jesus is. He's the one who has asked for it, isn't it? 
So it's important to understand you must work in such a way that people would like to have what you have. And then finally, to understand that witnessing cannot be done like that. I wanted to read about that around, around time, but I would like you to go to the book of uh, Romans chapter 10 from verse 8 right up to the end. And it says, faith comes by hearing. A lot of people think faith comes by seeing. So they are in their place of work, they work well, and never talk about Christ. Hmm, it Payuki, they will see. Now, the Bible, you are controlling the scriptures. The scripture says, faith does not come by seeing. I've already emphasized the importance of seeing. But all the seeing does is to give you a platform. The faith only comes by hearing. So if you do not verbalize your message, oh, you are, you are a good Christian. I'm a good banker. They know Christ. They might guess that you are a good banker. They might even agree you are a good banker. But when they hear you are from Nyandarwa, they know good bankers come from? Am I communicating? So the only way they can know it's Christ in you is if you tell with your mouth. Faith comes by hearing. And there are many people, especially people who are senior in their place of work. They don't talk about Christ at all. The argument is, they will see through my works. It's not in the Bible. Why don't you admit you are a rebel? There is nothing wrong with it. There are even senior people who cannot go to the lunch of a fellowship because they are too senior. You know, when I, when I got in top management in Shell, somebody asked me, will you still be attending fellowship? I said, I attend because I need it. And I need it even more when, when I'm more senior. Am I communicating? So when you're in a board meeting, I'll tell the other, hey, today is Wednesday. You are invited to the fellowship. They all burst into laughter. But at least the management meeting ends. So I can go for the <laughs> fellowship. Am I communicating? It's important to understand as you get senior, it is the parishes changing. When you are junior, you don't know what happens in the boardroom. The Lord expects you to be a witness among the juniors. When you finally become in the management meeting, your parish has changed. You must continue witnessing at the top level because nobody else will be there. Am I right? So you, what I'm trying to get you to understand is you must verbalize your message because faith comes by? Let's pray together. These things are easy to say, but I want you to spend a moment praying for yourself. Would you say that you're a witness of Christ? Or one earlier question, do you know Christ? Do you enjoy walking with him? If that's not true, I'd like you to go to God and say, God, this exciting walk of faith is not mine yet. But today I feel I want to start it. Jesus, save me, forgive me. I want to walk with you and so become a witness. Or maybe you, you are saved, but if truth be told, nobody gets affected by your faith at all. Either in your neighborhood or in your place of work, or among your clients or among your suppliers, they never get affected. And you know the Holy Spirit is talking to you. Why don't you go to God and say, God, I, that message was my message. My life will change. I'll bring more people to the Lord because I'm willing.